to thank God for our uh, series uh, Unraveling the Mystery of Godliness, which God has helped us to go through uh, eight topics so far, and we're on the last topic, the ninth one today. Let's give the Lord a big hand. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the title today is Stability by Righteousness. We have looked at all those topics, and I'm not going to go into them today because we have so much to do. And I want us to get through as quickly as God helps us. So um, I would encourage you, however, these messages are online in our, on our YouTube page, LiveGate Outreach TV. You will see them. They are saved as a playlist in the, in the, or, or, or in the folder Unraveling the Mystery of Godliness, uh, or in the playlist Unraveling the Mystery of Godliness. And also on uh, uh, podcasts, all the different platforms, you can find the messages uploaded uh, there regularly. So please avail yourselves of this because it helps you to see all that God spoke to us in the course of the series. Um, so this, con- this uh, stability by righteousness is our final session, as I've said. And the idea I believe God wants to pass across here for us is to understand the place of stability as the righteous. God has given us a grace to be stable. It is important to know how to be stable as Christians. Stability means that we are firm in our faith in God. This is one virtue that a Christian needs to have all the days of their lives till we see Jesus. It is one thing to get born again, thank God for that. Without that, there is no hope of eternity whatsoever. That is eternity with God. However, after becoming born again, we must realize that there is a journey that is in between the point we got born again and the point we will eventually meet with the Lord. That journey is a journey that places a demand for stability of faith on us. God does not want us to be unstable. People who are unstable place a limit on their ability to attain. They place a difficulty on themselves in terms of being who God wants them to be. God wants us to be strong. Somebody say strong. God wants us to depend absolutely on him. He wants us to be people who have a confidence at every way. Now, this has nothing to do with not being able to, not not having trials or difficulties. This means that even with those things, as we will learn in the course of the message today, we must be people who have found our refuge and our strength in God. So it is so important. The story of Jacob and his sons is very poignant on this topic. Genesis chapter 49, Jacob was about to die and he wanted to bless all his sons. And the very first thing he said about his first son is something that I would like us to take some notice of in the course of the message today, throughout. In verse 1, And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. After I'm gone, I want you to know what will befall you. Verse 2 says, Gather together and hear you sons of Jacob and listen to Israel, your father. Now, read with me from verse 3. We'll read verse 3 and 4 together. Let's go. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Verse 4. Unstable as water, you shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Go back to verse 3. Verse 3. He said, Reuben, you are my firstborn, undoubtedly. You are my might. You are the beginning of my strength. You are the excellency of dignity. You are the excellency of power. That is who you are. But because of your instability, verse 4, because of your instability and foolish ways, now I'm qualifying the verse, I'm qualifying the the, the message of, um, of, of Jacob, 
because of your instability and foolish way of living and your looseness and your disregard for things that are important and your flimsiness, your, your whimsical attitude to important things, covenant things, because you make light to things that are very important, regardless of the fact that you are the excellency of my dignity, regardless that you are the beginning of my power, you are unstable. You are unstable, like water that only goes where it is pushed. Like water that only finds its way around, navigate, navigates its ways around river courses and around rocks and obstacles. He said, because you are unstable as water, you shall not excel. Somebody say, I will excel. Yes. Say, God will help me to excel and I will excel. Instability is a big problem, and in the body of Christ today, we must understand every one of us has a responsibility to determine to be stable. And I'm going to share a few things with us today that God laid on my heart. There are so many things we can look at, but in the context of time, and I believe what God wants us to look at for this season, we can see a few things. We need the wisdom and the knowledge of God in order for us to be stable in the affairs of life. For you to be a consistent person in this faith, and as you walk through the affairs of life by faith, as a child of God, you need the wisdom of God, and you need the knowledge of God. Isaiah chapter 33, verse 5, the Bible makes us to understand. He said in verse 5, he said, The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high, he has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. The Lord is exalted, and he, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. Verse 6 says, Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times, and the strength of salvation, the fear of the Lord. Somebody say the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Every one of us must remember this. Now, the Bible talks about the sevenfold manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And one clear one he gave us there is the spirit, the, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and verse 2. He's a, you can just make a note of that. Is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. It talks about the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of might, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge. Then it talks about the spirit of the fear of the Lord. It is important. What Reuben lacked was this same ability to fear the Lord. If you read the entire story of Reuben from Genesis chapter 29, you can, you, you can, you know, I'm not just, just noted from Genesis chapter 29 to verse 50. If you read the entire uh, story, there are bits and things that tell us how significant Reuben was as a person. Reuben was the person who saved Joseph from being killed. That's how powerful he was. He was the one who said to Joseph, who said to his brothers, don't kill him, put him in a pit. And he had good intentions. His real genuine intentions was to make sure that Joseph was spared. His plan was to go and bring Joseph out of a pit. But before his, he could get back there, his brothers got a hold of him and obviously sold him into slavery. So he was that kind of a person. He was sensible in that way. He was a person who went to, to, to get mandrakes for his, his mother, Leah. Don't forget, Leah, Leah was the was a, uh, maid of, uh, was a, sorry, was a sister of Rachel who had um, a child first before Rachel, who Rachel loved. You know the story of Jacob? A very complicated character. But then here was Jacob married to Leah and Rachel. The first child that Jacob, the son of promise, will have was Reuben. It was Reuben. This is the first child. But this man was growing up and he saw the misery that his mother was being passed through. At a point, he went and collected mandrakes, which used to help with fertility. Last week, we were talking about some herbs that God has provided to mankind to just help heal and solve problems of man. These mandrakes at that time were believed to solve fertility problems. So he went and plucked them and was giving it to his mom so that his mom can have more children. And because the more the mother felt she needed to have children because of how Jacob was despising her for Rachel. You know their story very well. If you don't, from Genesis chapter 29, you can read all these things I'm saying to chapter 40. 
uh, to chapter 50, actually. And uh, Rachel, you know, obviously wanted some and all that. And um, Leah said, why would you want to take my son? You have taken my husband. You want to take my son as well. So, and then, you know, the mother had it. And then she ate it and gave birth to another child called Issachar. But the reality is this. The whole thing I'm going is that he was so disciplined with all that. But there was a maid of, after Rachel died, there was a maid of, uh, uh, a concubine as it's called, of Jacob called Bilhah. Bila was a concubine of Jacob, but when Rachel died, somehow the Bible, Bible scholars suggest that paradventure started getting into Rachel, uh, Reuben's head that, uh, that he had to start taking charge and doing more. And he took that lady and went into her. That is, had carnal knowledge of her. And that ended his potential. Did something rash, something brute, and that ended his potential. Now, I gave you a CV of a man who has done so well. A man who really, like the father said, had the potential to excel. But by this one rash action, put a limit on himself. To the point whereby, later on, it was so difficult to read anything about the, the offsprings of Reuben, even after they got the land, and so on and so forth. I make that emphasis because the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is his treasure. Every one of us must walk this walk of stability by the fear of the Lord. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, For this is the whole duty of man, that the, the whole duty of man is to fear God and to keep his commandments. This is why man exists. So we need to walk in the wisdom and the knowledge of God and the fear of God to be stable. We also need to be obedient. Somebody say, we need to be obedient. We need to be obedient in the light of, of the word of God that we hear always. In the power tower, those of you that were here, I was talking about how important it was for the man in John 9 when Jesus said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. The washing, the going to the pool of Siloam and the washing was what separated him from blind, between blindness and sight. And as he went and washed, the Bible says he came back seeing. Obedience is so important. We have no choice. We are living in a generation that is gradually easing at the place of disobedience. We are at ease in Zion because of the mercies of God. When I was growing up in our early days, we were taught to fear God. Maybe a little bit of it was overboard, I must say, but peradventure it has helped us. It has helped us. We were taught to fear God. We could not despise instructions. If we were told to do things, we, we gave explanations if we couldn't do them. We have a generation now that doesn't even care to lie. They will say, I will do it, knowing fully well that they are not going to do it. They even know that they are not even there. They are not even available. <laughs> they are not going to be there, and they know. I'm not talking of somebody who intentionally wants to be there, but something else happened. We're a generation that can just lie easily. We're a generation that finds it very, diff very easy to do those things that should make us tremble because we are not walking in the fear of the Lord. Obedience is a very important virtue that we must have. Jesus gave a story in Matthew chapter 7. He said two people built a house. One built it on rock, another one built it on sand. As an engineer, I, as a civil engineer, civil structural engineer, I know obviously that if you build your house on a bad foundation that is not treated, you can have the house standing up, but it's just a matter of time. Is that that the house sinks with you inside or it sinks when you are away somewhere? It's just a matter of time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So it is not, it's not rocket science, as they say. He built it on sand, but the, the emphasis of Jesus was the fact that the both of them, the two people, built. And you see, this, has de this is deceiving many today. Many people are building, and so believers are confused. Everybody who names the name of the Lord and has a pulpit like this and, and has a thing called church is building something and a lot of believers are not distinguishing between what is genuine and what is real. The reality is that it's just a process and a matter of time. Everything that is not built on the obedience to the true word of God will not endure the test of time. Every one of us must understand. Jesus explained. He said in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 24, he said, Therefore, whoever hears these things of mine and does them, he said, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house, where? On the rock. And verse 25 says, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, 
and beat on that house, it did not fall, for it was founded on a rock. Look at all the things that came against that house. They came against the other person's house, but it was blown away. This is why we must understand that our Christianity does not give us immunity to the things and the, the pressures of life and the things that blow against every body. The psalm, he said, it is the same sun that shines upon the wicked and the righteous. It is the same moon that, that shines upon everyone or that we all use. However, it is also the same adversities. It is the same floods we face. It is the same challenges we face. But everyone who hears the word of God and obeys the sayings of God is a potential candidate for stability. Hallelujah. This is why as believers, we must be people who intentionally make sure that we are hearing the word of God and we are obeying it. Every month, every message here, since God gave me that revelation, we pray before every message. Lord, the grace to speak the word, that is for the preacher. The grace to hear the word, that is for the audience. And the grace to believe the word that they hear, that is also for the audience. But much more, the grace to obey the word. Because you can hear it. But if you don't obey, James chapter 1 said, let us not be hearers only, but doers of the word. You cannot do what you don't believe, you, what you have not believed. You cannot believe what you have not heard. But what makes the difference is in the doing. Every miracle that we saw in scripture involved some kind of doing. Get out the water pots, do something. Cast your nets to the right side, do something. Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, do something. Whatever he says to you to do, just do it. Every one of us must understand, we are again a generation that likes shortcut. We like things quick. We are called the microwave generation. We've been called that many, many years ago. We like everything very quick, short and sharp. We, which, which may sound okay because modernization means that we can do things quicker. We can do many things now that we couldn't do before. So it's not a bad thing. But when it comes to the things of God and the, and the faith and the way to apply ourselves to being stable, we must apply ourselves intentionally to the timings of God and also to understanding the fact that we have to live in obedience. So I'll quickly tell us four areas. Like I said, there are many, but I'll quickly tell us four areas that we as the righteous are called to walk in stability. The first thing is the stability of doctrine. Somebody say doctrine. These are a set of beliefs that we have drawn from scripture. And um, many people have different doctrines, but as Christians, we have basic doctrine. The basic doctrine we have as, every, as Christians is what we read in, in 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, which, which we read throughout this series, especially the first five topics. And without controversy, 1 Timothy 3, 16, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He was justified. You should all be able to recite it with me. Now let's go. Don't project it. God was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen by angels. He was preached on among the Gentiles. He was believed on in the world. And he was received up into glory. Anybody who says he's a Christian and does not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is not a Christian. Whatever he is, I don't know, but he's not a Christian. A Christian must clearly be able to say Jesus Christ is the Son of God and is the Lord of my life. A Christian must be bold to say Jesus Christ died and he rose again on the third day. A Christian must be able to say without a shadow of a doubt that he has ascended into heaven and is coming back for as many who have received him. These are basic doctrines that we must not compromise. We must be stable in doctrine. A lot of the things we are seeing in our world today has nothing to do with Christianity. A lot of the things that we see in our world today has nothing to do with, with the, the doctrine of Christ that he left for us and the, the ones that the apostles who were the forerunners ahead of us planting the church left for us. Every one of us must be very careful. It is very easy to access wrong doctrine these days and it doesn't matter who is preaching it. It doesn't matter how long a person has preached the right thing. They can go off and start preaching wrong. You must know where they have missed it. It is your duty and my duty. We can't follow people blindly, including me talking here. If I say anything and you cannot find it in scripture, I give you 
authority to disregard it. But God forbid that you find that in my lips. Every one of us must work hard to understand. Ephesians 4.11 says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Go to verse 14. He said that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. What we see all over us today, all around the world, are people who are tricking men. People who are gathering crowds by trickery. And we have been warned that in these end times, that many people will gather such because they know that people have itching ears. Have you noticed that the people who sell products know how to market it very well to you? They sell it to you. They don't just bring a product to you and say, buy. They look for the thing that attracts you. They look for the person that will be most attracted by this product. And they go to them and they say, look at this product. Because they understand that man's covetousness and man's greed always will draw him. The Bible says many people are drawn away by their own lusts. So they use it to sell things. And this is, this is the same thing that is happening today. Paul said we should be careful that we should no longer be children. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, just write that down. He said that you should, as newborn babes, de de desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. God wants us to grow. There are too many babies today. They, today, they listen to a message. Somebody said that uh, you need to hit your head against the wall three times and say, Jesus, 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 before you get born again. And they say, ah, maybe my pastor has not been getting it right. This is what they say we should be doing. <laughs> so they go to their house. They say, after all these years, I didn't know I was not born again. So they start hitting their head against the wall. I mean, utter nonsense. I see many people saying they are, they are doing prophecies today and they gather 5,000, 10,000 people and all they are saying is, I saw you walking in one bush and you are following somebody. What has that got to do with salvation of souls? What has it got to do with salvation of souls? People come listen to theatrics in church and do drama and do all kinds of things and shout hoo-ha, hoo-ha and they go out, they don't even know the basic reason of why they have gone to church call some of those people and say why are you a christian they say i don't know i like when i pray god answers my prayer is that why you're a christian <laughs> i like that church the pastor is very hot <laughs> it's very hot there is power 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 okay so what 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 do you understand as being a christian ah no that man if we preach i heard the prophecy of this one <laughs> that's all they know because every sunday that is what they have gone there to see and Paul said, go back to Ephesians 4, 11. He said that it is for that, thank you. He gave some, those people, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He said for the equipping of the saints, verse 12 actually. He said for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Every one of us need to be stable in doctrine. Doctrine is not only taught, it is learned. You have to be a student of doctrine. You have to make sure that you put into you. If you are a professional, you understand that the more you put into you the ethics of your profession and the things that make you deliver well in the profession, the more you are able to deliver in that profession. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved. A workman that is rightly dividing the word of truth so that you will not be ashamed. You will not be tossed hither to. Every time you hear a word that is not of God, your spirit man will tell you if you are studious. You will hear preaching. It's very clean, very clear. Then it gets to a place. You say, mm -mm -mm. okay, let's keep over that bit. <laughs> let's go on. And it's, it's okay because human beings make mistakes. Human beings put in their flesh and their, their experiences, their bitterness and everything. Hallelujah. There is no doctrine anywhere that says any man is a covering of another man. Don't be deceived. Somebody tells you I'm your covering. You leave my presence, you are gone. It's a lie of the devil. There's no doctrine anywhere. The only covering we have as children of God is God Almighty. He covers us all. Who is a man to cover you? Who is a man to cover you? Stop looking for one man to cover you. I will not cover you. If you are looking for me to cover you, I'm looking for covering. <laughs> It's not my job to cover you. It's my job to pastor you and to teach you the word of God. That look at the covering. Can you see the covering there? That is the covering there. I'm under that covering. Get under it as well. That's my job. Hallelujah. 
A lot of people are manipulating people and talking all kinds of things, putting people into fear. Anyone that puts you into fear to serve God, run away from them. You are not to be afraid to serve God. You should have the fear of God. There are two different things. There are two different things. To fear God means you love God. You don't want to hurt him. You love God. You believe in his mercies. It is part of the fear of God. But anyone who says to you because you are not giving something or you are not doing something, you are going to hell, is a liar from the pit of hell. It is time for believers to rise up and be strong in doctrine. I prefer to do this work God forbid, but I prefer to do this work and go to heaven alone without a church member than to preach heresy in the name of gathering crowd. Every one of us must stand. The Bible says we are warned of the end times that doctrine will be very flimsy. A lot of people will do the trickery. Go back to Ephesians 4.14, please. He said there will be a trickery of men. There will be deceitful pl plottings, cunning craftiness. He said be careful of these. So God wants us to be stable with doctrine. Now, this does not mean that we should be rash with people. This does not mean we should be arrogant. There is a way you can reject something with dignity and still give the person you are rejecting it from their respect. <laughs> Hallelujah. You have to learn how to do that. It doesn't give us room to insult anybody. But we have to all understand that we have a personal responsibility at the end of the day to be sound in doctrine. May God continue to help us in Jesus' name. I cannot overemphasize this point enough, but I want every member of this church to be a studious person. Know the word of God for yourself, because the world that we are living in today has thrown out and spewed out so many things that are heretic, that are not of the word of God, that are not of God, and are not of the kingdom of God. We have individual responsibility to grow in understanding. And having said that, let us be humble enough to ask things we don't know. Somebody gave you something so powerful on, on the internet and you felt wowed by it, but somehow something is on your inside telling you that this doesn't sound right, this doesn't sound right. If you can decipher it, fine, but if you can't, that is why the apostles are there, that is why the pastors are there, that is why the teachers are there, to give you an equipment. Bring it, bring it. In this church, every Wednesday, we have a Bible study where we can ask any question on the theme we're looking at or anything that is confusing. Bring it to that forum or ask anybody that you can ask personally. Bring it to us and let us help you to look at the word of God together so that we can be sure what God is saying. The number two place to stand in st to be stable is in our life purpose. This means we must live a lifestyle of discipline and integrity regardless of temptations, tribulations and trials. We must be determined to live a lifestyle of integrity. In this life, you will face tribulation. John 16, 33, Jesus said, you will have tribulations. So John, Jesus did not mince words to tell us that maybe, maybe not. He said, in this world, you shall have tribulations. You shall have tribulations. But be of what? Good cheer, for I have overcome. So we must understand, many Christians today, the slightest element of tribulation, they are gone. The slightest challenge, they are gone. The slightest thing that looks like a difficulty. I have explained the difference many times. A temptation is sent by the devil. God does not tempt anyone. A temptation is sent by the devil to pull you down, to make a mockery of your faith. It's sent by the devil to discredit everything that you stand for. That is what he did to Jesus Christ. He tempted him. The Bible makes us to understand. Matthew 4, Mark 4, Luke 8. He tempted him. But every one of us must understand these things. There are differences in the temptations and tribulations. Tribulations are simply sent to those by the devil. They are simply sent to those who believe in the Lord also to discredit them, to make it difficult for them to walk the walk. He is not so much after them falling. That is not his intention, like temptation. He's not after them falling. He's, he's trying to make it difficult for them. So every time they're trying to take the steps to walk, he brings something here. He brings a challenge there. He brings a challenge at work. He brings a challenge in their, in their ministry. He brings a challenge in their extended family. And believers in many cases have lost track of their own faith by walking away because of tribulation. Go and recite and put in your heart John 16, 33. Every time you are going through a tribulation, 
He said, the Lord said, I should be of good cheer. He has overcome. It's just a matter of time. When you are traveling to a place, you know, at times it looks like you are driving all the way to heaven. If you've never been there before and it's three hours away. And you are going and going. But as long as the sat nav keeps telling you that you just keep going this route and it's just a matter of time. And right before your eyes, you'll be seeing the time decrease from three hours to two hours to go, to one hour to go. Now, if you stop at one hour to go, have you reached your destination? No. But you know, you'll be tired in yourself. You will feel weak at times. At times, yeah, you may, you may stop to refresh. But the idea is that you, as long as you keep going, you get to your destination. Hallelujah. We must see tribulations like that. They only come, the Bible says they are light afflictions. They are for a moment. God wants us to be stable through tribulations. God wants us to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. People who were put through a test that was going to determine whether they will serve God or not. God wants us to be a people who are resolute that with or without him manifesting the way they expected, they will not bow. That is what God is looking for in this, our day and age. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. He said, therefore, since we have surrounded by this so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance this race that is set before us. He said, Run with endurance. Say with me, run with endurance. Say run with patience. The race that is set before us. Every one of us must understand that we have a responsibility to run. Verse 2 says, let's read verse 2 together. We all know it, but let's shout it out together. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's follow his example. He endured the cross. He despised the shame. Do you know that if you are really going to be a Christian in this end time, are you aware that you will have mockers? Are you aware that you will have people who will be laughing at you? Are you aware that you will have people who will call you names? Are you aware that you have people who will lie against you just to discredit you? Are you aware? He said that we endured the cross, despised the shape, made nonsense of whatever the enemy was trying to make one feel ashamed of. Many believers today are ashamed, are ashamed of their God. They can put Chelsea on their walls when Chelsea wins or whoever is the team that won. Is it Chelsea that won? They won something recently, isn't it? Because they didn't let us rest. Everywhere I saw Chelsea, Chelsea. That's how I follow my own football. Whatever I see is happening, I'll just talk about it. Anyway, I know they won something. There was, there, you know, my home country, Nigeria, when they do things, they do it overboard. I saw a picture I couldn't believe. They dressed a donkey. A cow, was it? You saw it? With Chelsea towel. All of them wore, about more, more than 100 people wore Chelsea vests or jerseys and carried a big Chelsea flag on streets that were not paved and there's no... <laughs> I said, I can't believe my eyes. I didn't even see this anywhere in England. Not one place. <laughs> Supporting Chelsea. <laughs> we have funny people. <laughs> We're a generation that can celebrate anything openly. But when it comes to Jesus Christ, we are covered. We say, let's, let's, let's use wisdom now. <laughs> say, Pastor, we, we have to use wisdom now. Eh? <laughs> yeah, political correctness now. Let's, let's take it easy. Take it easy. No, the day I saw that people celebrate whatever they want to celebrate, I said, nobody's going to stop me from celebrating Jesus. I will celebrate Jesus. I'm not forcing you to come and believe in him. I believe in him. The same way you believe that Chelsea won. The same way you believe that Chelsea is a team that will win again and you are so proud of them or you are so confident of them. Then that's fine. That's your belief. My belief is that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords. is the King of glory. He is the one that is our soon coming King. Coming back to take us all home. Hallelujah. If you believe the same, you will be bold and confident to despise the shame. Number three, we must be people who are waiting for the promises of God. We must be stable in waiting for the promises of God. We read Romans chapter 4 initially. We read it from verse 13 right down to verse 25. 
in the course of our Bible reading. Pastor Moses led us very powerfully. But I want us to understand this thing. In verse 20, talking about Abraham, he said he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Every one of us must understand that the promises of God are yea and amen. 1 Corinthians 1.20, that means that they are yes and they are amen. That means that they are guaranteed to come to pass. What we must understand is that the, the principle of God's timing is very important. What God does in time is to make it beautiful in the manifestation for you as a person. So the way your life will go is not necessarily the way my life will go. We believe the same God. But he who created all of us understands that in the process of time and the ways and manner that things went, that there, there is a place and a way. And we just need to be patient with God. We just need to be patient with God. We just need to settle with God, waiting for his promises. Not waver at any promise of God through unbelief. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Your, your stability is your ability to trust in God. Your ability to enjoy peace or your capability to enjoy peace is in your ability to keep your mind stayed on God. Believe that God is sovereign. Believe that God knows what. Many of you know the story of my pastor friend back in Nigeria, very childhood friend. In our 20s, we were very, very close. We ministered. We were worship leaders in the same church in the early 90s. And we were so close and we've been never close since then. We were so close to the point where uh, our marriages were in the same year. Mine was in December. His was in the November before. So I was his best man at his wedding. Some of you who were at the anniversary last year would remember him Zoom, Zoom conferencing us in during this celebratory service. We both got married in 1995. And uh, before we knew what was happening, obviously, you know, I started having children and family was growing by the grace of God. And, you know, it was like, yeah, you know, we just trust God, my friend. It's going to happen. And we keep praying. Before we knew it, 10 years had gone. You know, 2005, 2015, 2020. Then God did the miracle. After 25 years, my, son had their, my, my friend had their first son. And we celebrated and we're still celebrating. I see the picture of the young man today. He's just a little bit over a year old. We just celebrated his one year recently. And I looked and I said, God, you are, you are wonderful. Your ways are past finding out. When we were getting married in December 1995, nothing told us that that would be the journey. The only assurance we had every time we prayed was that God was going to do it. God was going to do it. And I want to thank God. I celebrate my friend and his wife so much for not staggering at the promises of God. You don't know what it is for a pastor to wait 25 years. Anybody can have a challenge. But you see, the, the challenge of a pastor is that you are the same man praying for others. And as you are praying, they are bringing their children to you for dedication. You need to know God in a very, very different way. <laughs> the mortal men don't know him. For you to hold such babies and still dedicate them in joy. Not for one year, not for 10 years, not for 20 years, but for 25 years. So, but you see believers today, their cat died. The whole world cannot rest again. Their dog had fever and is shaking. And they say, Pastor Dave, please pray for me. What is happening? My dog is shaking. Your dog. <laughs> Give him something to eat. He will stop shaking. We are such people that are not understanding that the promises of God are yea and amen. And we are people who must know how to wait on the timing of God. Now, I am not saying that everybody has to wait that long for anything. But I'm telling you about God's timing. When you are a person who knows the promise of God, let me tell you one secret. You are not moved by what you see along the way. It is only when you don't know the promise of God that you'll be worried. Once you hear God and you know his promise either through his word or by direct rema and he tells you, this is my plan for your life. 
I know the plans that I think towards you. They are of good and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. And it settles for you in that matter. Do you know that whatever you see along the line is irrelevant? Because you know that God cannot fail. I say God cannot fail. You must know how to be stable in that area of waiting on God. I say this with every sense of humility that I can muster within me. But honestly, before the first member of this church came, God had already told me that this would be a very successful ministry because his hand would be up upon it. He had told me that the people to worship and gather and make their abilities available per time would never be lacking and that the ministry would never lack resources. This is my rest. This is my rest. This is why when anybody feels that it's time for them to move on and they want to pull a this thing, which many people do in many churches, they, they want to pull something and make it look like there's a problem. I say, hey, come, 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 come. There's no need to fight anything. You, know, you want to move on. God bless you. It is well with you in Jesus' name. God prosper you wherever you go. And I mean it from the depth of my heart. Because it is not about me. Trust me, you were not there when God spoke to me that this will be successful. So thank God for you and thank God for what you are doing today and thank God for what everybody has done. But every one of us is able to rest and not stagger the promises of God when we know what God has told us. This is with all due respect. I value people and I wish that God will help us to keep family. But you know something? A lot of pastors have resorted into stressful living because of this. Every one parent must understand what is God saying to you about that little baby today? What has God told you? What has God said to you from his word, from his rema? Do you know that as you grow, as that child turns to age 5, age 10, age 15, you may see things that are completely contrary to those things that you were told? Do you know? You must stay focused. Not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief. Because one day, somebody say one day, whatever God has said, say whatever God has said, will surely come to pass. He said he will never leave you nor forsake you. At times you may think that he's away. You may think that he's not listening. You may think that he's not seeing. But no, he has promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Every one of us must stay rested in that word. And keep being stable in waiting for the promises of God. The Bible says Abraham did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief. Something will come and tell you, as God really said. Something will come and tell you, are you sure? Say, so don't listen to that pastor. You know his life is sorted. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorted by the grace of God. Amen. Say, <laughs> so don't listen to him. Don't listen. All those men, they, when they talk like that, they don't listen. You are not in the same category. It's a lie of the devil. If I tell you, I've been telling you a lot of my stories. If I tell you some things you have never heard from my history, you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked. You say, you mean you have ever gone through that? Yes. Many, many times, many things. So we all have stories. And even this one that we are in today, very sorry to be story again. I say to be story again. Because the level we'll be operating then, will be saying, you mean you ever went through that kind of thing? You say, yes, we did. Hallelujah. There is a way God is going to do what he says he will do in your life. But you must learn, like Abraham, to wait tenaciously. Waiting does not mean complacency. It doesn't mean you are, you are faithless. In fact, it means you have faith. What gives you guarantee that you are waiting is your confession is still positive. Your confession is still positive. Those of you waiting on God for the next phase of your career development, keep speaking. Don't curse where you are today. Celebrate where you are, like Joseph, celebrating in the house of Potiphar. They threw him in prison, got into prison, was a joyful man again until they got, he got to his throne. Never complained once. Keep celebrating God. You are waiting for your child to come. You, you celebrate God. Celebrate God in the life of others. You celebrate God. You and your wife, every day, go home. Celebrate God that one day and go to the place that you believe God. Celebrate God that one day you are going to have your children praying, playing and praying all around you. I say you are going to have all your children playing and praying all around you. In the name of Jesus. Keep celebrating whatever you do. The devil will come and say, are you sure? Are you sure? This is taking long now. Are you sure? It doesn't happen this long for everybody. Those are lies of the devil. In the course of the week, I was sharing with, with some of the brethren. When we got married, uh, the, the, the year we got married, we wanted to just you know, take some time to have our children. We had decided that we, we, we were young. We were in our mid-20s, so we felt you know, we can still take our time to have children. 
and um, just enjoy ourselves, you know, and uh, we did. And then more so, my wife was still in, in school, in university. And um, then after a couple of years, we felt, yeah, let's, let's get on with it. And then, you know, before we knew it, it was now starting to look like a problem. Every time, you know, she would say, ah, I've seen it again, and those kind of things. And I remember traveling to the UK in, uh, at some time in, in that point, and um, I came April that year, and uh, in uh, May, just as about the time I was preparing to go back home, I, I was we were living in Nigeria then, uh, I said, we called, and I noticed she was crying on the phone. She said, this thing is really getting much. That, you know, this person asked me what is happening. And if you come from my background, you know that happens a lot. People will look at a woman who's been married two years and three years and say, sister, what is happening? And the devil will arrange them many days like that. <laughs> about four of them will ask you the same question. And somehow they don't come to the men. They know that the men will, not, will just drive them away. But they keep going to those ladies who will feel it the most. And they say, oh, well, we are praying. We are praying for you. <laughs> Whether they are praying or not, we don't know. But those words can be very hurting. And the reality is that she was crying. And I said to her, I said, okay, now you are crying. I'm in England, you are in Nigeria. What do you want to happen now? Even if we pray and say something should happen now, what can happen? There's nothing we can do now. I said, so stop crying. I said, by the grace and mercies of God, when I get back home, the Lord will do what only he can do. I said, go and celebrate God. We used to have praise service in our church that those days. Every Sunday evening, we come back at six and just praise for two hours. And we pray and go home and start a week. Very powerful thing. So she went that very week, the Sunday that we spoke. And to cut the long story short, I got back May 25 that year. February 25, the following year, our son, first son, was born. Don't tell me anything more than that. But that is our testimony. May 25 to February 25. Exactly at the time, according to the time of life. God has a way of intervening when he said it is time. When it is time for you to take delivery of your miracle, nothing will hold it back. I say nothing will hold it back in the name of Jesus. If I didn't tell you this story, you would never have believed it. Before we knew what was happening, the second one was coming. And then before we knew what was happening, the third one was coming. I went back to God. I said, Lord, thank you so much. You are a very faithful God. <laughs> at a time I was praying, Lord, have your way. But at a time I had to go back to him and say, Lord, thank you so much. <laughs> that is how God will over, overrun your life with testimonies. He will overflow your life with testimonies in the name of Jesus. Linked to that, finally, is our prayer life. Let us be consistent in stability of prayer life. The, blind, the man called blind Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10, his story is very interesting. They wanted to stop him. They said to him in verse 48, they said, be quiet. But the man said to son of David, he cried out the more, have mercy on me. He cried out first time. They said, keep quiet. He cried out the more. Verse 49, so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Every one of us must understand that in prayer, we must not compromise. We must learn to remain stable. When anything is suggesting to you that whatever you are praying for, it's not going to happen. You cry out the more. Be like Elijah. He said there will be rain. God told him there will be rain. He prayed first time, nothing happened. Second time, nothing happened. Third time, nothing happened. Until the seventh time, he said, they said to him that something literally is appearing. He said, that is it. That is the sign. Every one of us must know that we must continue to cry out to God. Not in unbelief. You see, at a point, we were taught in our Christian work that repetitive prayer is uh, faithless prayer. It is not always true. Now, it can be if one is praying and truly their heart is not believing what they're praying. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about somebody who believes every time they bring the matter before God. In this church, Monday to Friday, we pray every week. We have started by the grace of God from January 2018 and we have not stopped. Let's give the Lord a big hand. A big hand. And I want to thank God for those of you who make time to be at that Pray, those prayer meetings. I was hearing some testimonies here on Friday. God reminded me. He said there are answers to some of those prayers from years ago. And we have not seen anything yet. From three years, two years, when we intentionally began, what we will be seeing is a manifestation of God that will so beat our imagination. We'll be wondering, when did this happen? When did that happen? But it takes consistency in prayer. Except I travel, I'm always there. 
except I'm out of town. Even when I travel, I've joined those prayers from Hong Kong, from USA, from Trinidad, Dubai, everywhere you can think of before lockdown. I've joined because I believe in prayer. I believe that if you are consistently praying, you are like blind Bartimaeus, even though it looks as if he's not listening, even though it looks as if voices are telling you that you are not getting anywhere, but if you press a little bit more, and you press a little bit more, verse 52. If you press a little bit more, go to verse 52. He said, then Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith, your faith, your faith has made you well. The man who presses to the last is the man who gets well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Every one of us must understand we have a responsibility to continue to persist in prayer. We have another, again, another believer generation we pray a little and we give up because we don't see the rain. We stay in a church and we just want something. And when it's look at ah, they say there's no power there. <laughs> you don't know that God has a plan. Wherever God says you should be, whatever God says you should be doing, you must be tenacious and focused in doing it consistently. Mark 11 verse 22. The Bible says, so Jesus answered and said, have faith in God. Verse 24, he said, therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe. Somebody say, when you pray, believe. When you pray, believe. Say, when you pray, believe. When you, pray, believe. you receive them and you will have them. Believe. You will receive and you will have. This is our own work. There must be no room given to unbelief. James 1, 5 says, if we lack wisdom, we should ask God. Verse 6 says, but let him ask in faith without doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let him ask without doubting. Verse 7 says, if you doubt, let not that man think he will receive anything from the Lord. Don't go to God doubting. God has all power. And the way we know we are not doubting is when we pray, we need to check our confession. We need to check what we are saying. Is what we are saying agreeing with what we have prayed? It is not a sin when you discover that your confessions are going contrary to what you have prayed. God is indicating to you that you need to walk in faith. So you, instead of continuing it and feeling bad about yourself, you say, Lord, deliver me from unbelief. Deliver me from unbelief. Set me free from unbelief. And I believe you because I know I will receive. The Bible says such a man is double-minded and unstable. Verse 8. You will not be unstable. I say you will not be unstable. In the name of Jesus. Friends, Christianity is warfare. It's warfare before funfair. A lot of us do not like the warfare. The Bible says we are wrestling. Not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. It is not for us to be afraid, but for us to understand that this journey needs us to, deliver, to develop capacity. The work of the ministry is to encourage the believers to grow capacity in themselves. Please, this does not mean we don't support each other, pray for each other, help each other. But I want you to know how to get God for yourself. When you know how to get God for yourself, many things that look like problems today will not be locating you anymore. I said they will not be locating you anymore. A lot of believers all around the world today, and I say this to those online, a lot of believers all around the world today are being groomed in churches to only be people who depend on church leadership, depend on their pastors for prayer, depend on their evangelists and their apostles and those people for prayer and for support all the time. Now, there's nothing wrong for somebody who just got born again to understand the discipleship and being grown. But for somebody who has been in the faith five years, ten years, always running to your pastor for every prayer point, is doing a disservice to the kingdom of God. You need to grow. You need to grow. If you need brethren to pray with you, that is fine. But don't let that be the norm for your life. I desire to see Christians growing strong, raising others to grow strong. This is how we are going to continue to unravel this mystery of godliness to our world as we await the coming of the Lord in the name of Jesus. And the last verse is Psalm 55, verse 22. Say, cast your burdens upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Keep casting your cares on him. You cannot carry anything by yourself. 
I cannot carry anything for you. I cannot carry anything by myself. But what I can do, and what we should always do, is to keep casting our cares on him, because he cares for us. And God will continue to sustain every one of us. In the name of Jesus. You will not fall due to sin. I say you will not fall due to sin. You will not fail in days of tribulations. And the trials of this life that will come your way will build your faith. They will not consume you. They will build your faith. In the name of Jesus. Let's rise to our feet and, and trust you.